our first speaker, uh, Paul Carr. Uh, he's been here before, nice enough to come back. He's a director of Aerial Phenomena Investigations, a local group that investigates uh, UFO sightings. Uh, frequently people have asked me, well, what if I want to be a UFO investigator and, and investigate some of these things myself? Is that possible? Well, you can talk to Paul during the break. Um, you know, he, he may have an opportunity for you to be one of his investigators. Um, so uh, Paul's going to talk about his organization, but he's also going to get into, shall we say, some philosophizing about this uh, whole UFO field. So um, I don't want to take any more of his time, so please welcome Paul Carr. Looks like I got... Oh, well, um, that's all right. <laughs> um, yeah, that's all right. I can fix it. I swear I didn't. Touch it. <laughs> okay. Not a not a big deal. We'll just go with the, We'll just go with right there. All right. Uh, Justin's not here yet. I I think he's going to be here at some point. Um, but uh, yeah. All right. And let me get started here. Uh, good morning. I only have 35 minutes uh, for this talk today. Oh, let me get, yeah. I only have 35 minutes for this talk today, and I want to save some time for questions. So uh, allow me to start with a very brief account of who aerial phenomena investigations are and what we do before moving on to the main topic. Um, if you wanted the long version, I recommend a recent episode of Justin Bamforce's Terra Signals podcast in which Marsha Barnhart and I go into some depth about what we do at API. Um, and uh, Justin did a really nice job editing that, by the way. By the way. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's get to the next chart. Who are we? Well, um, in uh, about 2009, I experienced a daylight close encounter with a black rectangle in the Maryland suburbs of DC. Daylight. This led me to spend some time searching online for UFO sightings in my area while completely failing to do a proper job of documenting my sighting. In 2011, Antonio Paris asked me to join his new group collecting citizen UFO reports and conducting the best investigations practical of those sightings. At that time, we were called Maryland Aerial Phenomena Investigations, MAPI. Um, after a certain amount of diaspora, we dropped the Maryland part. Um, Antonio moved to Florida, and he's no longer part of the team. Um, we write detailed reports on our investigations and redact them of all witness personally identifying information before sharing them with the wider community. In addition to the investigations, our aim is to inform the public as best we can, and we're always looking for new ways to not only improve our investigations, but to join the broader community in searching for better ways to explore the entire topic of anomalous aerial phenomena. Okay. Next chart. Come on. Uh, just put this like that. Oh. Okay. This is a little bit about our website. Um, so I invite you to visit our website and uh, have a look at the, uh, if you go to reportaufo.org, uh, you'll, you'll get a bunch of tabs up near the top and you can click on any of those to learn more about API. Uh, I hope you can see this, a little bit too, maybe a bit too detailed. Um, but anyway, just uh, all kinds of things you can learn about us. I'm, I'm not going to go into the depth on that right now. I just dropped my speech. Okay. So, um... Uh, 
Uh, I'm not loving this. All right, there we go. Okay, um, just remember report at ufo.org. All right. I've already been to that chart. Um, if you're interested in becoming uh, an API field investigator, we don't have a lot of openings right now, but we do have quite a large backlog of cases that need to be worked, and we need some help in other areas. This is all on our website. But if you go to contact us on the website, you can say, I'd like to be a field investigator, um, and I'll point you to the right page to go look at, and, and there's some forms to fill out. And, and then we'll have an interview and so on. Um, you can also use this contact form to sign up for our newsletter. And uh, just by putting your email in, um, there will be a newsletter checkbox will appear. Um, and you have to solve a very simple math problem. You can use your calculator if you must. <laughs> That's just to keep the spammers out of the form. Um, I should, warn, I should note that we, we follow a disciplined, documented process, and a lot of our cases are not very much fun. So it's becoming a field investigator isn't for everybody. It's not always entertaining. Um, this is the third time I've spoken at this conference. In the last two talks, I have focused primarily on the investigations we conduct and have conducted at Aerial Phenomena Investigations over what is now 12 years. This time, I would like to take a look ahead at how things are changing, and in particular, the role of citizen investigators in this changing environment. This is not intended as any sort of manifesto. I hope it doesn't come across as a rant. But at the start of a conversation that I hope will be ongoing and will involve all stakeholders for years to come, I want to start with something that I don't normally do, a book recommendation. And it's not a UFO book at all. The book is called The Scout Mindset by Julia Goloff. It has nothing to do with UFOs, as I mentioned, but I find this kind of book that makes us look hard at how we think about things and what we can do about it to be valuable and widely applicable. Jonathan Rauch's The Constitution of Knowledge, which came out recently, and Aaron said in Tavris's Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me are two other fine examples. In her book, Goloff points out that much of our thinking is not to discover the truth, but to justify and persuade, mainly to persuade ourselves and members of our tribe of our core beliefs and to justify our history and intentions. The scout mindset departs from this. The scout, of course, has beliefs, but the cost of wrong beliefs is high. So all beliefs are open to question and modification. Curiosity is an exalted virtue, and dogma is a dirty word. She contrasts this with the soldier mindset. The soldier is there to defend, the scout is there to find out. And nobody is a scout all the time or a soldier all the time. It's, these are just two metaphors that we can, two poles that we can move back and forth between. And so I'm going to recommend that. It's a short book, I, I, so a couple hundred pages. I would suggest everybody get it and read it. Um, I like to think that the way we proceed at API is close to the ideal of the scout mindset. We are not out to defend our beliefs, not to debunk, or not to prove whether any particular hypothesis is true or false, but to approach every case with curiosity while avoiding fooling ourselves, as easy as that is, to help each other do battle with our biases and to nudge ourselves a little further towards the truth. In the last year or so, personal health challenges have limited 
how much investigatory work I could undertake. You might, if you saw me last time, you might remember I had more hair then. Uh, it'll come back, they tell me. Um, but I had to think and uh, recons reconsider nearly all, uh, and reconsider. Uh, now, fortunately, nearly all the cases we have received recently have been, unfortunately, I should say, nearly all the cases we have received have been either easily identified or just not very anomalous. Even though I know this comes with the territory, it can be a little discouraging. Let me show you a couple of easy examples. This was reported to us. This thing in the sky that a couple in New Mexico saw. They were driving down the highway. It was an aerostat balloon. Um, this is a, uh, a frame from a video, case 20.022. It was closed as unidentified. But we get a lot of things that are unidentified, but not very strange. And this is a good example. Just a little flickering light in the sky, no reference objects. Uh, not much you can do with that. Um, not very anomalous. Um, this is, let's see, is that play? Um, what did I do? Uh, it's just a frame grab, I guess. Uh, I don't know how well you can see it, but um, oh, yeah, just playing. OK. Um, these were um, sky lanterns over Philadelphia. We got a lot of those. Um, this one is a little more it was a little more fun, but still. Yeah, this video here. Um, this was some aircraft lights in Minnesota. You can understand why the witness might have thought it was a little weird, but uh, we were able to prove definitively that they're just aircraft lights. And you, know, you get a lot of aircraft lights. You get a lot of even daytime aircraft. So a little analysis with some of our best documented reports over the last um, well, since 2011, really. Um, really good cases are rare. This is strangeness rating. We rate every case zero to five, strangeness. Zero means we can identify it. Five means it's really got some puzzling aspects and that don't make sense. And uh, the... Um, this differs from case quality. That's different, or what some people call probability, which is a measure of how solid and reliable the evidence is. Unfortunately, some of our best witnesses are single witnesses. And no corroboration can be found anywhere. We look for it, we don't find it. And I think a lot of other field investigators from other organizations will tell you the same thing. I looked for corroboration. I put ads in the paper. Nobody came forward. Right. Um, this was case 18010 in Pennington, New Jersey. The witness did an exceptional job of documenting his close encounter about one hour after it happened. This is just one page from his notes and sketches he shared with us. We closed the case as unidentified with a strangest rating of three, which is quite high for us. But corroboration was not to be had. No one else came forward who had seen anything. And this was a, you know, it's a Trenton suburb or in central Jersey. Uh, there were people around. They just didn't see it or they didn't report it. They didn't admit they saw it. And uh, we even did a site visit and everything. And uh, let's see. There's another sketch here. This is a witness sketch from a case in uh, Western New York. And this was a free student saw this 
triangle, but only one of them would talk to us. The only reason we know there were other two other students is the first one that talked to us said, yeah, two of my buddies with me, and they, they, they are not going to talk to you. <laughs> they do not want to go on record. And as well, you know, we, we won't release their names, we won't tell anybody who they are. They don't trust us, or they just, they fear the stigma too much. So, uh, that, you say that's a, not a very artistic sketch, and that would be correct, but we want sketches. We want everybody to give us sketches. I don't care how bad an artist you are. Um, and uh, as you can see from this chart, that's a tile chart here, uh, it was strange just on one axis and case quality in the other. Everything kind of clusters down towards the low strangeness, low case quality at corner. Um, very rarely do we get high quality high strangeness cases. We've had a couple, but it's not, we're small, we don't get, we don't get thousands of reports a year, so um, it's more, it runs more like 60 reports, about one a week, that, that we can actually do anything with. And so that's, uh, and remember the, the Peddington, New Jersey case I just mentioned, a uh, very nice uh, job documenting the close encounter, but with no corroboration, we couldn't rate the, case quality higher than two out of, out of five. Um, and it, and, and we, all, we all agreed that the guy, we had this, we all had this subjective impression the guy was sincere, he was telling us the truth that he, as well as he could remember it, and he had done a good job documenting right after the, the neat close encounter. So, I'm not easily discouraged, but when I am, I, it prompts me to ask questions about what I am doing and why. And I I can let that one go. I was hoping to have more room on the podium. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the most The most important way to improve the support of the professional science communities is to reduce the emphasis on eyewitness testimony in favor of instrumented surveillance and observation. Will that work? I hope so, but possibly not. As uh, Peter just mentioned, there have been a lot of changes lately. There's more professionals are coming into the field. Now, a lot of them are being, some of them are being dragged, kicking, screaming, but others really want to be in it. A lot of young professionals, I've spoken to Beatrice Via Laurel, who's um, a member of Project Galileo. In fact, I think most of the Project Galileo people really want to be in Project Galileo, um, even though they will face some stigma and they will face some possible career limiting choices. But I don't think that they're, uh, I think they're real pros who really want to study the thing. Um, the government stuff, well, you know, we may have, we may have some, uh, this is a, a quote from the recent RO report. Um, just, you've all seen it, I'm sure. I won't belabor it. You might remember, If you've been, most of you have been around long enough, you know about the Robertson panel, Project Blue Book, Project Grudge, and the Condon report, um, where the government makes a big show of studying UFOs, but is really the, the, the agenda is to dismiss or deny or just de-emphasize. Um, the that, now, the Connor Report came out when I was 10 years old. I wasn't even aware of it at that time. But, uh, you know, 55 years ago. That was a long time ago. There have been almost three generations that have grown up since then. So, you know, there is some hope that maybe things are a little different now, that we're not quite so dismissive. Um, 
some paradigms have, a lot of paradigms have gotten disrupted in, in 55 years. And perhaps the one that says that, that we can understand the natural world as it is without taking into consideration that there might be some, something else out there. Uh, SETI has actually gotten a decent amount of respect now. It used to be very much uh, a career limiting thing to get into SETI. Um, but serious scientists got into it and took their stand and they're doing serious science. Um, astrobiology is the same way. Astrobiology used to be, when, when Carl Sagan called it exobiology, he got a lot of flack for that. He did. Even though he, he was a UFO skeptic, he was very much a life on other planets optimist. And uh, so, um, what have we got here? Oh, this is a uh, picture of the Condon report, Condon report that was actually put out on Bantam Books. I don't think, today with the internet, we won't need to do it that way uh, with the RO reports. This is, the, this is the usual process that we followed for 70 years. Uh, for citizen reports, we do a preliminary investigation, we interview the witness, we do the fact finding that we can, that we can do, whatever it is. We write a report, maybe there's, it's quality checked, maybe it's not, um, and then we archive it, and we hope that somebody else will be able to use that information in the future. Um, but it, most of this, this archive sits there. It doesn't, it's not active, it's not researched, it's not queried. A lot of times because it's on paper, it's very hard to query it. Um, we're trying, to, at API, we're trying to improve on that. But that's a different story. It's all well and good, but it's never enough. This, our, this is a graph of our process, which is very similar. Just, this is in our training material. Um, okay, that, that, was, that was coming up again soon. Um, so what's, what's the future role for the citizen ufologist in this environment in which a lot of pro professionals are getting involved, uh, which I personally think is encouraging. Now, they have a learning curve to go up, and they're, they're going to discover what we've all discovered already, that this, uh, whatever it is, it is we're looking at is puzzling and unpredictable and never does what we want it to do when we want it to do it. And you can go years and years and years without seeing anything, um, even if you're trying really hard. You don't really hunt UFOs. I think they think they can kind of hunt them. Well, maybe they can. Uh, let, let's give it another shot. But what's our role? Citizen volunteers. Those of us who don't do this for a living, but do do it a lot. Well, the, my short answer to this question is that I am highly uncertain what our role will be. We have to be prepared for the possibility that we will become obsolete, although my gut feel is that this is unlikely. However, we certainly will have to change and we'll have to ally ourselves with professional scientists to some extent. Experience has taught us that eyewitness testimony has its weaknesses and limitations and is primarily what we rely on in our investigations. Now for the long answer. Why don't I know how our role will change? It's partly because the nature of the phenomena themselves have been consistent in only one sense, consistently puzzling and consistently hard to pin down. It is some of these puzzling aspects that we are in a good position to study. And these are questions that the professionals with their sophisticated sensors may not be so well equipped to take on. What we have broad agreement on is we need better, more objective data than our investigations of sightings are ever likely to supply. No one I know disputes this, although there is controversy about when and how to make those data and their analysis public. I think we should find ways to make as much public as we can. 
whenever we can, adopting a data products model similar to what NOAA does every day that everyone trusts. I don't propose abandoning investigating sightings altogether, but we need to be more purposeful in selecting which sightings we investigate by asking ourselves a tough question. What research questions are we trying to address? Do we have a well-formed hypothesis? Maybe not. Hypothesis isn't just a random guess or conjecture. It's a pretty big deal. A good hypothesis, at a minimum, is observable and testable. It allows us to update our estimate of its truth or falsehood from the data we obtain or intend to obtain. If the data we obtain are equally likely, whether the hypothesis is true or false, then we either need different data, higher quality data, or a better hypothesis. Working hard to formulate research questions and refining them into the hypothesis will help bring much needed discipline to our field. I think that at any given time, we need to have two or three research questions before us, front and center, that we reasonably expect to make progress on. These questions will be subject to ongoing community-wide discussion and will evolve over time. Some research questions I'd like to throw out for your consideration. In general, we don't know, for that small percentage of reports that are genuinely anomalous, to what extent, if any, the phenomena interact with a witness, is sensitive to the witness, or even depends upon the witness. We have no idea, for example, why some people observe multiple UFOs in their lifetime, and many others, probably most others, never do. Yes, some people are delusional or fantasy prone, but we don't believe this explains all of it. API has already taken some baby steps to studying these things, but we need help from researchers who can really dig in and help us understand the data we are collecting. For example, we make a habit at API of probing whether our witnesses have had past observations of UFOs or similar anomalies. Many say they have, but very few, if any, of these sightings have been properly investigated. We need better data about these serial experiencers and very good long-term data about the most credible serial experiencers. What makes them different? In my opinion, no one really knows. By the way, doing this ethically is a thorny business. My little informal research question that needs a lot of refinement, is it possible to hunt UFOs or do they hunt you? Some days I believe it's the latter. We are investigating why with almost and now everyone carrying a camera with them in their pocket and the quality of those cameras markedly improving in recent years, why there are still no good, clear videos or photos from close range that have been verified as genuine. We all know there are lots of fakes, although we reject the simple-minded explanation that there is nothing there. We do take this question seriously and routinely ask our witnesses who did not take a photo or video why that was the case. And this is, what, this is from our report template. And you can see, if witness took no photos or videos, reason given. We're taking that data on every case. Uh, if they took photos or videos, obviously that's not applicable. One common reason given is there was no time to get the phone out before the object was gone. Witnesses are generally too gobsmacked to take any action at all for the first few seconds if not longer. However, we don't really know the reason or reasons we have never been able to surface such an image or video, although we have many videos of small dots flickering in the sky. Uh, I'll get back to that one in a second. Um, the Skylab 3 image Skylab 3 photos from 1973 are as credible as you get. But don't tell us much about what the astronauts saw. It's very likely a point source with a little motion blur. There are many other credible photos and videos with a solid chain of custody and solid follow-up investigation, but none is unambiguously evidence of any hypothesis I can attempt to form. 
the uh, that one got out of place. The uh, 2020 video from Ohio is the best I've seen. But it's very likely a point source, very bright. Not the structured craft we all want to see. If you know of any exceptions to this, please make me aware. No lens flares, please. There are, so there are some questions we make progress on with field research data. We need to share all the data openly across the research community in a more or less standardized way so that we can analyze these cases with as much good data as possible. For example, I would love to see the reasons for not shooting a video analyzed over hundreds or even thousands of thoroughly investigated cases. That, we don't have that. And, and we could get it. That's data we could get. I should add that we need to get more social scientists involved. What questions should we ask and how should we ask them? I'm an engineer. And I get confused in the realm of dealing with human memories, explanations, and perceptions. How best do we find out what sort of person you're dealing with? OK. But what about if we go beyond just field investigation of sightings? Where I think then at that point, you know, if we move beyond that old paradigm that we've been on in for 70 years, which I've just suggested we can improve on, but I think that there's more. In my opinion, we are moving toward a broad category of activity that is known as citizen science. Citizen science is a thing and has been going on for a long time in many fields of science. For example, a lot of com comets have been discovered by highly skilled amateur astronomers. There are many citizen science projects you can join. I've joined some of them. Uh, sponsored by governments, some are sponsored by academic organizations or volunteer groups. Uh, I participated in the Galaxy Zoo project when it was open. Uh, it was kind of fun. Uh, and I plan to say more in the Vasco SETI project in the future. By the way, uh, I just mentioned Beatrice Villarreal. She's in Project Galileo. She, she's also one of the leaders of Vasco, uh, which is looking for astronomical objects that have disappeared um, without explanation. So, um, and th these are professional, they're professional astronomers. They, they, they have a very good idea why things should disappear on, for astrophysical reasons and why they shouldn't. You're probably aware that a lot of people have moved into the area of sky surveillance. It's not just UFO hunters who are interested in this, but some, for some years now, low-cost cameras have been set up all over the world by professionals and amateurs to detect meteors. And this has gotten quite sophisticated. Many fireballs can be traced back to their atmospheric entry points and even beyond that to determine their orbits before they hit the atmosphere. If you want to detect luminous or daytime UFOs, you can use very similar equipment, but you will need different software to filter out clear false positives, some of which will be meteors. People are working on this, and they should be. Of course, it isn't just video. Since we don't understand the phenomenology of UAPs, we should be looking for subtle variations in electromagnetic fields, radio signals, which are also electromagnetic fields, and other physical sensing modalities to the extent possible. Cameras and magnetometers are cheap, but some of the other gear might require a better funded professional project. The advantage of cheap equipment is we can put it anywhere, since we have little a priori idea where to look. Okay. Now I can go back. Oh, that's not the one. Yeah, this is a drawing that was uh, that a witness had made with a, from an artist friend. Uh, we have one really spectacular black triangle sighting in our files from downtown San Francisco at 4 a.m with millions of people with inside of it, but only one witness on record. And I've talked to her. I, th I believe that she's sincere. I don't believe she's crazy. 
I, very rarely do I think a witness is crazy. Of course, that's not really my call, but you know, every once in a while you talk to somebody, you think they're just not, they're not keeping it together. But no, this lady seems to, she's, uh, she's a normal person like you or I. And real UFOs don't show up often, and when they do, it's rarely for any length of time. An expensive sensor suite is a waste of money if you don't know where to locate it. A lot of cheap sensors and live humans equipped with binoculars and mid-priced video cameras can, in principle, cover enough of the sky to gather meaningful statistics. Most of you here could contribute to such a program of sky surveillance. And I encourage you to look into that. And I'm doing that myself. One of the hypotheses we could test with comprehensive surveillance is whether the phenomena are sensitive to being surveilled. Are there more or fewer good and properly investigated reports in a surveilled area or not surveilled? If there is a strong statistical signal there, it is certainly seen to indicate not only intelligent phenomena, but highly aware phenomena. Does this help us understand why we don't have a single good photo or video of a black triangle? Or rectangle, in this case. That's a lovely drawing, but that's just how it is. Downtown San Francisco. Um, now, sky watching is nothing new, but it needs to be done systematically and scientifically, not just going out to Lovey's Leap and sitting around for a few hours waiting for something to show up. It takes organization, training, planning, record keeping, and some OPSEC awareness to mitigate hoaxes. You don't need to be an expert on anything to join a sky watching team, just a team player with patience, common sense, and a work ethic. You shouldn't expect to see a lot of UFOs, but you will see many things moving in and out of the sky. The same is true of a field investigator for that matter. If you want to organize a citizen science sky watching or, or sky surveillance group, then let's coordinate. We can standardize a few things that our data can be combined straightforwardly, trade ideas, for avoiding false positives and help each other find good observing sites. I don't want to be the leader of a sky watching organization, but I'm happy to work with other people who do want to start teams. Um, ideally, the clearinghouse for these observations would, would be at least partially staffed by professionals with hot button connections to those in control of the more capable assets, including NASA, NOAA, DOD, NRO, and foreign government. As I understand it, said clearinghouse does not exist as such. Now, I want to note that the model of citizen science that works best seems to be a large number of citizen volunteers and a small cadre of professional scientists who organize the effort, provide training and resources for the volunteers, and curate the data collected. Citizen science is the UA in the UAP space is a relatively new idea. idea, and only baby steps have been taken to date, but I think we should take it seriously. We need to move forward to ally ourselves with the government, private, and academic organizations looking for enthusiastic volunteers' help not only to watch the skies, but to filter sighting reports and cell phone videos for the obvious IFO, something we have a lot of experience with. Back to the, back to the scout mindset. This is probably more we can do as citizen UFO scientists. Maybe much more. Maybe that you've thought of and I haven't. Your thoughts are important, especially when you and I strive to adopt the scout mindset and join this community in a search for truth. Let's all apply a liberal dollop of epistemic humility. We're in this field because we know something is going on that doesn't quite fit the worldview we were raised with, but we don't know what it is, and we may not even know what questions to ask about its nature. However, humanity has a long history of multi-generational efforts to get our arms around difficult concepts, and when we are willing to do the work. And finally, a little inspiration from the 1990s. Here's something I think we do know. 
The truth about UFOs isn't in this room or on the internet or on our TV screens. UFOs are out there as unpredict at unpredictable times and places. And we, all of us, need to get out there where they are any way we can, align with anyone else who really cares about the truth.